from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Fighting men stand ready to carry on America's oldest military tradition, to attack, to attack the forces that threaten us. With all the men and all the equipment, we can hurl against them. That has always been our prime strategic principle, to attack the enemy whenever and wherever we find him. In all our wars, no matter how heavy the odds against them, American soldiers have struck often and struck hard. Each era has seen them fight with new weapons, but always with an unconquerable spirit, which in the end achieved victory. In 1776, we won the right to be a nation with shot, powder, flintlock, and guts. As America grew, the weapons of war became less primitive, more difficult to make and operate. In 1848, swift striking cavalry units gave our army power and mobility. The more effective it became, the more it depended on supplies hauled from shops and factories far behind the front. During the Civil War, we put steel over our engines on land and sea. We took to the air. In 1898, we perfected the use of the repeating machine gun. Then in 1918, war came of age. Today, the American soldier is part of a vast, complex organization composed of many arms. The infantry, the cavalry, field artillery, coast artillery, air corps, engineers, signal corps, armored force, and many services. This is your army, Uncle Sam's fist. Swinging that fist with pile driving force is the arm behind the army, Uncle Sam's muscle. American industry, responsible for mobilizing its vast resources for the needs of the army, our Under Secretary of War, Robert Patterson, and Lieutenant General Brian B. Somerville, Chief of the Service of Supply. Behind the desks, behind the drawing boards, behind the benches, on the assembly lines, American industry is making the greatest production effort in history to supply our army with ever increasing quantities of the weapons of war. Soldier for soldier, our fighting men can match anything the Axis sends against them. And worker for worker, American industry is determined to meet the Axis challenge in the production plants. Management and labor alike stand solidly behind us. They know their stake in this conflict. They know the grim fate of free enterprise and free labor and the path of Axis conquest. Vienna. The world famous workers' tenements symbol of Nazi-inspired dissension between Austrian working men and Austrian industrialists. Soon after, Czechoslovakia, symbol of Nazi-inspired dissension between allies sworn to defend it. The Skoda Munitions Works, symbol of industry compelled to forge the means of its own enslavement. Soon after, labor permit. The Nazis exercise complete control over who works and who starves. Labor restrictions. The Nazis degrade working men because they know that free labor, working in free industry, can never be shackled to the Axis dream of world conquest. Poland. Labor and industry know that the Nazi occupation of Poland means economic ruin. It means labor gains. It means slavery for hundreds of thousands of Poles kidnapped by their conquerors to work in shops and factories. There are four and a half million foreign workers in Germany today. 
who are forced to produce weapons to fight the nations that seek to liberate them. It means terror. Starvation. Justice. Nazi justice. Holland. This was once the heart of Rotterdam's business section. France. While German tanks thundered across its fields, much of French industry lay idle, unaware of the mortal danger to its institutions. If the French army fell, the railroad car at Compiègne, negotiations for surrender. Negotiations which might never have taken place if France had been united and prepared. Now French industry works for the Axis. Old age pensions. Group insurance, workmen's compensation, all the benefits that labor has won in every decent, highly industrialized nation. None of these benefits ever belong to the workers of Germany's new henchmen, Japan. Japan, where living standards are pitifully low. But where millions are poured into modern factories to carry on the policy of their treacherous warlords. Japan, who for 10 years has ravaged and pillaged the gallant people of China. Japan, who cried peace. Pearl Harbor. The brunt of the cowardly blow struck at Pearl Harbor was borne by the Army and Navy. But all over the United States, men and women in American industry knew it was a blow aimed at their lives, their liberties, their pursuit of happiness. They accepted the challenge. They are tackling the biggest job in history to outproduce the Axis, can they? Economists say the natural resources of the United Nations are greater. But the capacity of the Axis to turn what resources they have into weapons of war is tremendous. They have the mighty Krupp munitions works. We have Birmingham. They have Skoda. We have Delaware. They have factories like this in occupied France. England has Vickers. They seize the steel mills of Luxembourg. We have Pittsburgh. They have great factories to turn out Heintels, Messerschmitts, Dorniers. We turn out flying fortresses, P-38s, P-40s, Aerocobras, Tomahawks, many others. Romanian oil drives their planes and tanks. Oil from the fields of Oklahoma, Texas, and California will drive our planes and tanks. All down the production line, plant for plant, the Axis and the United Nations stand locked in battle. It will be the sweat of workers that tips the beam. The sweat of American workers who will give you men tanks and planes and guns to fight for our free and democratic world. A gun every 26 minutes. A tank every 12 minutes. A plane every nine minutes. Competing against men who often work at the point of a gun, who must produce or else, free American industry has pledged itself to deliver those tanks and planes and guns on time, ahead of time. This war is industry's war. It is labor's war. They realize that defeat means the unconditional and permanent surrender of all they are or hope to be. No sacrifice now will be too great for them, because sacrifice now will ensure final victory, ours and theirs. When we win, they win. A telegram from the army, a message from the fight for the factory. Seven dive bombers escorted by fighter planes swarmed down an enemy fleet and seriously damaged jet cruiser. Credit for this operation must be shared by you men and women who made these planes. Signed, Lovett, Assistant Secretary of War for Air. Large Japanese convoy escorted by Jap destroyers hurled back by American-made big guns. Their power and deadly accuracy are a testimonial to the skill and effort of you workers. Congratulations. Signed, Stimson, Secretary of War. 
performance of American 28-ton tanks enthusiastically cheered by our allies. Keep up the good work. Signed, Patterson, Under Secretary of War. Wherever American soldiers fight, the arm behind the army fights with them. We will win our battles on the firing line because they will win their battles on the production line. They're fighting beside us now. Together, we will smash ahead to victory. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.